all, since we're back at the second part, I'll quickly pause in case anybody had some desperately urgent thing they thought of over the tea break and wanted to ask about uh, what we've discussed already. Total silence, okay? I'd assume not. Oh, Seth had something. It might be a really stupid question. I was just trying to follow the whole thing you were saying about, I mean, the quantification of coins is kind of interesting. I imagined it would be an easy thing to do, but actually it seems way more difficult than um, counting pottery. Um, <laughs> but the thing that you were trying using the, the, the counting the number of dies per yeah. year, I can see that that's that gets you quite close to the information that you want. But then there's the next step beyond that, which I don't think you did show on the table, which is you've got the number of dies per year, but then, then there's another inference we made about how many coins were struck from each die. And you said that there is some minor variation, but like how big, I would have thought there's probably quite big variation there, isn't there, which could then yes. also... Uh, that's, I think there was a big debate a few years ago in numismatics where there was one school saying, it's, this tells you nothing because a die can break after five strike coins yeah. or it can go on to strike 20 or 30,000 coins. Yeah. And the other people saying, well, on average, if they, you know, we know from written records from medieval, period, medieval Europe, mm. how many dies, was, how many coins could be struck. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is, it is a... You'd want to quantify that as well, yeah. wouldn't you? In that table, you'd want to know what, could, it could be somewhere between... Uh, 5,000 coins or 10,000 coins, or, or is it now? Actually, now? partly as a result of that debate, we want very hard not to quantify that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's it's happened is, yeah. is that numismatics has no confidence in its ability to tell you how many coins a die struck. Right? But it has quite a bit of confidence that given similar procedures, metals, shape, size, etc., of coin, that on average the dies made about the same number of coins. So what's happened is the closest to a consensus opinion that numismatics has developed is essentially a cautious one to say, we can tell you that there were they were making two or three times as many coins in Samatata as they were in Sindh, mm. but we don't want to say how many coins that was. Right? So we can give relative values, but not absolute. And one of the caveats... So you give the qualification, in because you put in the table just the figures of how many dies, but would you also try and put in there what kind of metal they're... they're yeah, so in, metal they're in that, in that particular case, all of those coins are of the same weight, they're all gold of about a 50% purity. They all have about the same relief. They're all derived from similar procedures that existed. Right? So across those three coinages, we feel quite confident. I'd feel even more confident if we were looking at the silver central provinces types, where we think that it's literally the same um, institution making the coins all the way through. But, for example, if I had a die study that told me how many... Uh, we mentioned the Vishnu Kundans, who make these, these copper coins with quite high relief on them. If I knew how... Uh, if I had a die study for them, and I had a die study for the silver coins of one of the Alcon rulers in the north, which are relatively low relief, quite flat space ones, I wouldn't want to compare those at all. I wouldn't have any confidence that their relative number of dies told me anything about their relative production. Um, so we're only able to do this in a relatively narrow way when we can say um, that these things are very similar in their initial production. And that's partly a result of this debate, essentially a consensus, very cautious opinion that we can establish relative values for things that are similar, but we can't establish absolute values and therefore can't compare dissimilar things, um, which does cause us a problem, right? which I'll kind of come to in a bit, which is, of course, sometimes we're comparing against monetary instruments that are not made by die striking. 
and then we have a problem of comparison at all. So, for example, uh, cowrie shells, right, at a later stage, are absolutely definitely testified as a currency. Were they a currency in the 6th century? Since I can't tell you how many coins we're actually talking about being made, I can't compare them with cowrie shells. Um, if a coin is cast rather than struck, right, which is the case for coinage in Orissa at this period, and is the case for coinage, uh, some coinage in Sri Lanka, I think, at this period, then I can't compare the die counts against any information I have for those because, again, the die counts are providing me only a relative value against other die counts. So the caution numismatics exhibits on this is a limitation on our ability to, to do the, the counting and measurement. Because it must quite, be quite interesting when you compare the, the die counts with, with kind of real world counts of, you know, like if you've got an area where there are lots of um, hoard, coin hoards where you have actually got, you can count numbers of coins. We have comparisons of this sort that can be made. And so to throw the information out there for you to make what you will of it yourself, we have an ancient set of accounts from the fourth century BC for a group of coins we also have a die study for, and they would give a figure somewhere in the region of 15,000 coins per die, uh, per obverse die, less. Greek, Greek coins. It's Greek coins, though. Uh, and we do, as Joe pointed out, have a set of medieval uh, mint records, which we can match against die numbers, and they give averages between about two and 3,000 per die and about 80,000 per die. Uh, with again the range broadly falling somewhere in the ten to thirty thousand area, um, so the some yeah. experimental archaeology. and we have some experimental archaeology and that largely bears out a ten to twenty thousand uh, number. Uh, essentially, we think it might be possible to do that, but. Personally, I think that numismatics is not far enough forward with that sort of study to have any confidence in its results. Whereas these kinds of purely relative ones we make of, these look very similar in all the respects we can reasonably measure, therefore their die counts are probably indicative of their relative production. Right? I feel a certain amount of confidence in, but I wouldn't want to go to actual numbers of coins. Um, and there's a historiographic reason for that, as well as a genuine theoretical concern. I am probably more cautious because of this debate that took place than... It, it was vicious. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, like all fields, you are cautious about things that have been heavily criticised, even even if you're not necessarily justified in your caution. But that's, that's why I didn't go there. But it's a, it's a good question. It's a good question. To... So talking about other things numismatists do, right? Um, I said that we're, we've therefore got a measurement of how much is made, but how much is made is not how much is in circulation. Right? You have to, and you don't know whether or not it's being used. Right? We, we won't have that MV for the money supply. If the coins get given out as royal largesse and then they're buried in the ground, right, and they're not exchanged, they're not actually having any effect on the money supply. So Sharma might be right. We might, they might make a lot, just as many coins, but they might not use them in the period in the way that they did in the earlier periods. And therefore, right, his assertion that the amount of coinage being used has gone down, which of course, remember, he came at having looked at other sources so he's not drawing that from the coins themselves, might be valid. Um, I'll just very quickly, numismatists can use techniques based on hoards to tell you whether or not the coins in the hoards have changed hands. Right? These are graphs showing how the weight of coins alters after they've been initially made based on different factors. And I'm gonna skip over them beyond telling you that, and this is an example, of distributions, no, no uh, yeah, this is an example of distributions in a particular hoard. My point is we have ways of measuring the velocity and circulation in numismatics. 
Um, if anybody wants to at the end, I can come back and explain a bit more about that. But believe me for the moment, they're very dull, right? but they are effective. Um, and on to the next one. So this is what I did want to say a little bit about, which is, uh, this is an example of a Gandharan copper piece, uh, a long anonymous series issued in the region of a site called Kashmir Smast in the northwest in modern day Pakistan. Um, it's on the Pakistan side of the border, isn't it? Kashmir Smast. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yes, yeah. It's, it's the northern Gandhara. Yeah, northern Gandhara. So um, we have here an assemblage from the site. Now, it's mostly been acquired through trade and people revealing inf in collections they've made from the site. But it's a single site. We have a large publication with close to a thousand coins in it, <coughs> so a, a, a good sample. There is an argument has been put forward by one Roman specialist, which essentially says when it comes to base metal coinage, your die studies are pretty much worthless because they tell you how much was made but not how much people were using. And he says, much more useful is what people drop. Right? Because when they, when they exchange, use coin to change hands, they lose some of them. So the amount you find in site assemblages is a better measure of coin use than the amount that's actually produced. Uh, name of the Roman numismatist I have forgotten, so somebody will just have to ask. No, it's... Mm, it will come back to me, or somebody can ask me at the end, and I can look through my references. <coughs> Leave it for the pub quiz. Yeah. Um, so what I did was I dug out the, one of two sites where we have this kind of information, which is Kashmir Smast, and then I ordered the information in two different ways. The chart on the top left here is the information as Sharma ordered it. So by its class by the type of coin. And the gigantic spike in the middle is the anonymous Gandharan copper, right? Shailendra's point, that the anonymity, the inability to attribute it, right, changes the way you look at it. The chart below distributes the coins over their period of production. So what it does is if the coins are issued for a 100-year period, and there are 200 of them, then it's assigned two coins to each year, evenly distributing them over the period of production, and then breaks those down into 50-year baskets to give the graph at the bottom. And you can see Kashmir smashed on an escalating scale up to the sort of 6th century. The ones marked in red at the back, Kashmir smashed is definitely not active as a site before 200 AD. So the coins in red are old coins still in circulation. It's probably not active before 300 AD. So the coins in the reddish blue, the purple, are probably coins right, that were still in circulation. Now, I'm raising that because it raises one of the other things about the amount of money that's available. A significant proportion of the money that's available is not money produced at the time. It's old money that's still hanging around. Now this is true of the coins in your pocket, right, where if you look most of the coins are going to be a couple of years old. Right? Some of them might be 10 or 15 years old. It's even more true of ancient coins. Right? The bulk of coins that you're using, that you have in a hoard, are probably 20, 30, 50 years. Um, the best example we have are the western satraps where the coins are individually dated and the age profiles there are... We have hordes which are composed of the Vices and Western Chinese. Yeah, so centuries between the, 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 the two yeah. groups of coins. China is even more. There are coins over a millennium of year old that are still in circulation. And that's quite important. It's important for two reasons. One, it gives an important caveat on the die studies. Two, it's important for Sharma's argument. A sudden, dramatic and short gap in the production of coinage need not have had any significant effect on the amount of coinage that was actually available. Right? If a particular dynasty collapses and as a result the mints stop producing coins, right, there's probably a lot of coinage still around, 
right? People are probably used to using old coinage. Right? There's no particular reason to assume that the amount of coinage available to them will drop significantly unless the production remains dormant for a relatively long period. Um, so, for example, at the end of the Gupta period, the reason the, Sam the Samatata coins, the very first of them, look like Kushan coins, and they're made at the end of the Gupta Empire or after its collapse. So the coins are being made based on a prototype that's two or three hundred years old at the time, which implies that that prototype was still familiar. So, uh, next one. <coughs> We can also count in a slightly different way. Hordes give us this opportunity. And the only place in the 6th century we can do this is West India, which Shailendra alluded to earlier. This is a posthumous issue of Kumaragupta. So it's a Kumaragupta coin, but Kumaragupta was dead when this was made. Right? And these carry on being made a significant period after his death right, in West India. Right? Um, there are Skandaguptas from West India, but no Buddhaguptas. So, um, as to just a little intersection, interjection in this is that you can ask why this is so and how, how do we know that these were made posthumously uh, because the, the inscription is pretty, pretty clear, it reads well, there is no sort of corruption. Uh, there have been another set of methodologies where people have mapped the typological degradation, the way the, the um, uh, subsequent sort of um, constant copying of the designs leads itself to degradation in terms of the detail, how that sort of detail then maps onto the debasement in, 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 in the silver content. And when you sort of map those two things, we get an approximation of how long uh, after the issue, the first issue is going to be. Yeah. So. And the, the giveaway feature on this particular one is that his um, collar around his neck is made of dots, which it isn't on his lifetime issues. And that's a feature it shares in common with the Mitricus and with, right, which places it into the same period, right, in the 6th century. So there are Kumaragupta, Skandagupta and Mitraka, all three coins circulating yeah. in parallel. And, and possibly some others. Right? Um, so again, there's this large silver coinage um, of the Western satraps, these small silver drums. This is very well known as a type catalogue of it. It's well studied. There are then lots of successor coinages. You could take the approach that was taken by Dale and record the number of hordes in which these things appear. I was able to pull together about 20 or 30 hordes relatively quickly. But what I did was take an alternative way of counting it. I took the latest coin in each hoard, assumed that the hoard was deposited at the time the latest coin was issued or close to it, and therefore that all of the coins present were in circulation at that point in time, right? and therefore came up with a chart that shows the rate of deposition, how many coins per year are being lost rather than how many are being made. And what you'll notice is there's a massive peak between 350 and 380 AD. Right? Uh, Shalindra has written a whole article on this, so he'd probably, he can explain to you what the important political event that was happening at this period was. Uh, which one I wrote? 350 <laughs> to 380 AD, the Western Satrap hordes. 350 to 380 AD. These are the very late Western, Western Satrap hordes. Yes, hordes. and well, there is, uh, the, the Guptas are coming in right. at that time, around that time. So, so they're threatening uh, Western Satraps and then around uh, early 400s, the conquest actually happens. But there is a sort of a window period that we see from coins that there are, the Guptas are pushing in and the Satraps are pushed back and then ultimately they, 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 they go. And that's, that's around early for the first decade of the fifth century. So that's what is, is, uh, is happening. So the fall was created by a crisis. Yes. So the peak basically means that people in Western Central Territories are burying their money because yes. the Murwari group town is coming. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, there is political uncertainty yeah. from mm -hmm. various kinds. Um, so, I mean, that is, there is a period of transition, mm -hmm. you know, so anxiety, obviously. Mm -hmm. And one can observe sim similar phenomena elsewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you get some 
clusters of burials in, in periods of uncertainty. And the important point, of course, is that what the chart also then shows you is that losses are still extremely significant in the 6th century. Right? That actually, right, compared to the period pre 3rd, 4th century, right, the coins that are being deposited are in very large numbers. Now, we have to be careful about this, as Shalindra says, political uncertainty, that either the possibility that your coin might not be worth anything in, in a few years, or that somebody might seize it, or, of course, the possibility that you bury your coins in a routine way, but are unable to return and collect them, they, um, can create hoarding. But also, these probably also just reflect that coinage is there in significant numbers. Um, and since, uh, you know, the best we can offer is an opinion on this, I think Shalendra and I broadly agree that actually there is a cross-regional trend for South Asia, and it's that the amount of money and coinage and circulation just keeps going up, right? That the country, that South Asia just becomes gradually more and more monetized, and its monetary economy becomes gradually more sophisticated as monetization spreads, and any retraction these are extremely local events. Right? West India seems to be the best case for that. So there's a very clear path of, or most of the evidence, when you look at it in isolation in West India, seems to indicate ever-increasing amounts of money in direct contravention to the evidence deployed by Sharma uh, and others. Yeah, on to the next. So again, We've got, so what we've done is we've looked at all those different ways of looking at it, and the very last one of these, right, the very last step is you've established how much is in circulation, either because you've done dye studies and then applied all sorts of modelling to it, or because you've found good assemblages or hoard data you can work from, and therefore you've established something about the money. If I go down this list, it's therefore. <coughs> The opposite, therefore, more coins were out, therefore, more, more coins, coins were made, therefore, more coins were in circulation, therefore, there was more money. Yes. So it's exactly upside down. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the problem commodity money. Not everything that's money is a coin, right? There are other forms of money in operation. This is the, we had a whole talk on the battery and documents. Here's a battery and documents. Right, from the year 356, so this is in the 6th century, right in the period we've done, right? Um, the loan, it's a loan agreement. Uh, Tet is borrowing from Muzd Pazbarun. Now, here's the critical thing. He's borrowing some grain. This is presumably because he hasn't brought his grain in yet and he needs to cook some bread. This is probably a food thing, right? Uh, it's probably facilitated by various social relationships, but it's monetized right, without having any coins involved. Because along with the grain, he borrows some wine, 21 jars of wine, right? And he has to return the grain in the contract, same amount of grain, but he has to return 24 jars of wine. The three extra jars of wine is his interest. Okay. So the wine isn't being drunk. It isn't that he drinks 21 at a party and promises that he'll supply 24 later. It's that it would be silly to borrow 10 bushels of grain and then give 12 bushels of grain back because the other person doesn't want 12 bushels of grain. But everybody wants wine. So he gives him the grain and he gives him some wine with it. And then later he has to give more wine back. Right? The wine becomes a way of attaching a numerical value to the loan. Right? We know this happens with cowrie shells, we know it happens with silk, we know it happens with other forms of commodity, that the commodities are turned into money. Right? Um, and numismatists refer to this as commodity money, standardised units of a commodity that can be used in similar ways to the ways we use coins, but are not coins. So this, um, is just, this is just a commodities contract. It's like well, pork bellies. Yeah. Um, the futures contract is what it is. 
you can read it and have to go rather yeah. than... You can, yes. I mean, this is, it's the only example, so it's a bit hard to be confident about what it says. Uh, I'm probably missing something here, but uh, you're saying Ted doesn't want to drink the wine. If it doesn't, why does he need to pour 21 jars of wine? Why can't he just return the grain plus the jars of wine? I agree. If we assume right, that what's going on is a commodity money transaction, it's very likely he never collects the wine. Right. Well, that what's, it, what's the point in mentioning 21 jars of wine? Because it gives you a one seventh rate of interest. 21 becomes 24. And what you're doing is you're turning a social exchange into a way of measuring money. We, we don't know for certain that's what's happening here, but we have other more complicated um, situations in places like Egypt or uh, the, the Tarim Basin where much larger amounts of documentation f survive and we can trace people doing this kind of thing. And we know that you know things like this can operate this way. So I give you some service and I lend you along with it two rolls of silk. You promise to return me three rolls of silk. Right? Um, at the end, I've created a sort of loan contract using the silk like I would use money. It's not immediately clear that the silk actually changes hands, right? um, but it's a way of attaching value to something. Right? Um, you know, we don't, yeah, we don't have a deep insight into the details of what the person's doing, right? Because it's virtually there's only two backroom documents where people do this, right? And normally, they do everything in coin, and so they've written the document in a very similar way to the way they would write it with coins, but the they've done this funny transaction involved handing over the wine and the grain and getting um, wine. Line back. Normally, everything's in coin. The chart next to you shows coin, uh, coin values. And even where the document doesn't contain the exact number of coins, we can see how much somebody's valued it by because the penalties have a fixed relation with the value of the contract. So even where things are exchanged in kind, right, the economy thinks of them as having monetary values. Uh, unfortunately, the Bactrian documents are the only set of sort of manorial records that survive from South or Central Asia in this, anything like this period. But presumably, every small kingdom and principality maintained an equivalent set of records. Um, and some of them might have used them to facilitate monetary exchanges, uh, creating, in effect, sort of monies of account that operate alongside actual physical money. Um, we know this happens in the Tarim Basin that there's a central pot of money and sometimes it's given out, but a lot of time people just have an amount of money in their account and the amount is transferred between accounts. So it's again, it's potentially increasing the money supply and the velocity of circulation without any actual coins uh, changing hands. Uh, which brings us to, how do we measure any of that, right, and the extent of monetization or market activity if we don't have, if we can't use the coins as a measure. And Gethin was actually got, uh, do you want to come down to the front to this? Yeah. 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 Um, Gethin actually discussed this with me uh, last night and he'd come across a Roman example of somebody doing this archaeologically. I think we're all very impressed with Robert's um, meticulous approach and his um, deep knowledge of this data set. Now, what I'm going to talk about now uh, exhibits none of that. <laughs> um, we um, are thinking about synergy. I mean, I think to, uh, you know, this is this project is about synergy. And um, Nathan was um, quite keen for us to exhibit some synergy today here. And I think um, in order to do that, you have to get a bit out of your comfort zone. So, and with that in mind, I'm going to talk about uh, economics, the Roman Empire, and computational modelling. And um, that's basically on the um, basis of a paper I was reading that I just mentioned, I mentioned to Robert yesterday um, when we were at the Research Associates dinner and he was interested in it, so I'm just going to present a little bit about that paper. Um, now, Robert's used a few macroeconomic concepts and um, two 
uh, that are kind of underlying of some of what he's some of what he talked about are rationality and knowledge. Um, now, agents in economies do not have always have full knowledge. So when he's talking about price um, in, or the amount of money in circulation in the economy, we don't know how much uh, money might, uh, how many coins might be in circulation in the economy then. At, the at that time, they wouldn't have known that either. So when we're applying modern macroeconomic principles to um, uh, ancient economies, we have to be quite careful. Um, so I'm going to talk, basically what I'm talking about is an article by um, a guy called Tom Brumans, who's a friend of mine, and Jerome Poblon, and it's called Roman Bazaar or Market Economy, Explaining Tableware Distributions Through Computational Modeling. So they talk about two theories of the Roman economy. The first is Peter Bang's Roman Bazaar. Uh, in, in this theory, the integration of markets around the empire was weak, meaning traders had a poor knowledge of prices and availability of goods. Uh, to quote uh, Peter Bang, um, such a scenario is distinguished by high uncertainty of information and the relative unpredictability of supply and demand. This makes the prices of commodities in the bazaar fairly volatile. As a consequence, the integration of markets is often low and fragile. It is simply difficult for traders to obtain sufficiently reliable and stable information on which effectively to respond to, de to developments in other markets. Considerable fragmentation of markets prevails. Now, in this model, the results were markets integration, markets, merchants would aim to benefit from opportunism and speculation in individual markets. And secondly, a social network of personal trusted relations and strong communal ties was maintained between markets. So unpredictable supply and demand meant the prices were volatile in Peter Bangs' theory, and markets function very differently to present day, where well-informed specialist trade facilitated by extensive and efficient networks. Um, now, you know, there might be some similarity between this and, um, yeah, so there's the article. And I must say, um, everything I'm talking about basically is coming from this article, so uh, this is not by any means my own research at all. Um, so markets function very differently to the present day, where well-informed specialist trade facilitates, is facilitated by extensive networks. Um, now the second theory uh, is Peter Temin's Roman market economy. In this theory, markets were strongly integrated. Um, a, quote, a quote from him, the economy of the early Roman Empire was primarily, primarily a market economy. The parts of this economy located far from each other were not tied together as tightly as markets are often today, but they still functioned as part of a comprehensive Mediterranean market. So in this uh, model, commercial information in one market was easily accessible in the others and knowledge was widespread. So those are the two theories. Um, now, the article takes up a social network perspective to examine this, and the, suggesting that integration of markets is high if the potential to share commercial information and goods directly between markets is high, and low if it is limited. The degree of market integration can therefore be represented as the proportion of all possible links that connect traders on different sites. Um, so, yeah, the bizarre mark argument, there's fewer connections on this side with weak market integration, and on this side we have a market economy with greater number of connections, so that's Peter Temin and um, Peter Banks. So in the article, they um, invoke a computational model um, where the Roman East is considered to have functioned as a complex system, where the small-scale actions and interactions of agents with only limited access to information gave rise to large-scale patterns. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of this model, partly because I don't fully understand it myself, um, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting approach that's being used in a lot of different archaeological projects at the moment. Um, now, a pair of traders, just uh, to give a couple of um, points about how the model functions, a pair of traders connected in the social network are able to share commercial information 
supply, demand and price estimates, and to trade tablewares. Um, the model mod models the um, movement of terra sigillata. Uh, now, production centres on the in a few places in the in a few locations in the economy, and based on the knowledge of prices, supply demand and demand available to the traders, they can choose to buy, sell, store to other trade or store goods and pass them to other or um, with other traders or local consumers. And the model therefore gives rise to different patterns of distribution for the four tablewares based on the two variables that I mentioned. The number of links between traders on different sites and the amount of information shared between connected traders. Um, and so those two variables are the two key aspects. And they also underpin these two models and so they can be explored. Now, Brumans and Pobolni apply their model to the Terra Sigillata distribution of, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, it's a large area and a well-defined database of shards um, with clear patterns in the overall distribution. So, they have a large proportion of this type called ESA and um, it becomes more even between four different types as time passes. So, their conclusion based on the model is that the high integration of markets have the potential to give rise to the archaeologically observed differences. And the structure of the social network within individual markets is less important than a high degree of integration between markets and the potential for one production centre to produce more than others. So, um, they, of course they give a lot of caveats but they end up suggesting that this model is, the, is more likely for the distribution of the terra sigillata around the eastern Mediterranean. So I would say that this has a couple of implications for Robert's presentation. The first is the possibility of applying a formal model like the one used um, to the coin distributions. Um, now, this we're a long way from that, I would say. We, it, we require a pattern in the coinage to be well defined. Um, and then, because um, that has to be tested, um, the, given different, um, given different uh, variables. Um, models generated could then be compared, um, but the specifications of models need to be explored using greater amounts of data, and, uh, and um, the models themselves need to be tailored to certain data so that they can be falsified or not. That's a big problem with models like Sharma's as well. Um, and, but it can give us a, 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 an idea of where we can further apply for, look to uh, carry out further research. Um, that could be in, into factors that enabled and structured and maintained communication between faraway com communities. So we can look outside the coins to look at the extent to which markets may be integrated using other forms of data. And the second implication is that the macroeconomic concepts that uh, Robert was talking about in their first part of his presentation um, are highly dependent on an understanding of the market. And we also saw that in when he was talking about the commodity, um, com uh, the commodities, because those um, can completely skew the picture, um, as can prices and market integration. So, Robert has mentioned the, that production and deposition of coins can be examined and highlighted the problem. Um, I mean, you talked in your paper, anyway, that you circulated, you talked about the production and the deposition, but it's this exchange um, in the middle that we don't understand so well. And perhaps broader archaeological evidence can help fill in gaps here. Um, two examples. Um, I, that could be looked at would be might be the distribution of red polished ware or roulette ware around South Asia. <coughs> so I thought that was it was interesting what Gethin had raised with me at dinner. I wanted him to kind of insert it there because it made clear that there are alternative ways to measure how economies are working. It's not solely a function of coins, just like the coins themselves are not solely. 
Um, so is there any thoughts on how easy it would be to count and categorise pottery in South Asia in a way that was comparable with those kinds of models of the Roman Empire? <clears throat> there'd be, um, be even more, I mean, the approach is, is quite innovative anyway, isn't it? I mean, it's a kind of, uh, yeah, I just think, you know, within obviously the data set that's available for the, for the Eastern Mediterranean is, is so much more complete than probably anywhere else in the world, isn't it, in terms of the volume of archaeological data, the knowledge of the pottery, the dating, the precision of dating of Teresa Gelata. Um, all those things mean that you have actually got a huge body of data to, to, to play around with and apply statistical models to. Um, but yeah, in India it would be, it'd be really hard, wouldn't it? Because we don't even have the, the, uh, the basic chronology and the basic classification of the the pottery to start with. I think you know probably most areas of India I've imagined, I mean you'll know a lot more about it than me, but as you know we're dealing with four or five hundred year um, time periods that the material can be slotted into. So you know there's huge huge amount of work that just needs to be done of very basic stuff of doing large scale excavations, of going through big assemblages, categorizing things, drawing things getting radiocarbon dating and, and just doing the basic sequencing before you can do anything in terms of fancy computer <laughs> But in some ways you're, you're violating the uh, first slide in your presentation which was you weren't going to get to a new theory and you weren't going to get to an explanation of feudalism and you weren't going to get to, well, a number of things. <laughs> but um, Gettin's paper has open those questions because what you what the pottery distribution is going to show you is something that the coins can never show you. Uh, and the first thing is people don't go around picking up pottery, they go around picking up coins. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and like this great horde of pottery shirts never sort of comes on the market. You know, I mean and it's just doesn't happen. It's just rubbish lying out there in the fields. So it is possible to do a surface survey and collection in a systematic fashion, not in an idiosyncratic fashion, but a systematic fashion across the landscape on these sites. Um, and that seems to me that coupled with what you can do in numismatics, it's got to be sort of tied with the ceramics because the ceramics, the, the ceramics are a proxy for people. Mm. You don't have a broken bit of pottery there by magic. You have it because somebody dropped a pot. And um, so the, the typologies and the quantities of ceramics are a, proxy, are a proxy for human activity and scale of activity, scale of settlement. And from there you can, from there you can move into... Oh, the, but pots mean lots of different things at the same time. Some pots are used for cooking, some pots are used as um, commodities that are bought and sold. Some pots are high status. I mean, these are all, you know, on, on very, into the very basic categorization yeah. of ceramic assemblies, they're used for different things. But we're a long way from being able to identify what certain pots were used for. But there's a lot more of them around than there are coins. Mm. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's, that's absolutely, but we know less about them than we do coins. <laughs> yeah, they, they haven't had the attention yeah. that they deserve because they're, not, I, so they're even less attractive than the ugly coins. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was some, in Sharma's model of not just feudalism but also de urbanization, yeah. there was a connection drawn between mm. the, 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 the availability and the lack of certain kinds of pottery. And he sort of uses, much as he uses paucity, circulatory coinage. Mm. bolster type model. He also uses pottery. And um, Derek Kennett uh, had began to assemble the data to demolish it. Yeah. As it was saying that, well, you know, again, the same thing has, that has happened with coins. It's, there are lots of methodological problems with uh, 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not ceramicist, so I don't know what exactly the methodological problems that he was referring to, but he said that there, is, there are particular, I think the pottery, the characteristic pottery that he was associated with is, is sort of red slipware. Mm. Red polish, he was focusing on red, red, red polish. RPW, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And uh, the, the kind of occurrence and disappearance of RPW is kind of, you know, was deployed as a, mm -hmm. in, in, in the same mm -hmm. model to say that there was deurbanization, but Derek's uh, data was, it wasn't. Mm. Also, a certain amount of settlement pattern issues were discussed in the same paper by Derek. I don't think he's published it ever. He has. Uh, he has? Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. And one of the reasons why, uh, you know, collecting pottery or is, is again fraught with problems is because the, the, set, the site settlement has sort of moved around and you can't really dig where people are still living. So all you have to base your data or get your data is from is all the peripheral mm -hmm. things, and they're not really the sites that were in, in, inhabited in as in, as intensively mm -hmm. as they are they were. So you know, so there is that kind of bias as well. So. In, in this paper, the suggestion is that when you have uh, such a large amount of pottery taken from such a wide area, that um, those biases then are less. You're not looking at yes. sites individually, you're looking at a, 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 a large corpus you know, yes. of material. Um, whether that's the case or not, I actually am doubtful. I would say that one thing I was actually going to say when I was up there is that you know, they could, I think, often the case that these digital tools or um, di uh, digital techniques, they, um, there's not enough, enough account taken of the problems with data itself. Yeah. Um, and, um, Know, they could do with perhaps taking Robert's approach to yeah. um, really um, try to unpack all those issues. Yeah. I think that is a, that's a really important point, which is there is a difference between systematic and stochastic errors. Um, it doesn't matter how many collections you look at, the pretty coins are still going to outnumber the ugly ones, right? Because the, the error is systematic, it's built into the, the method. Right? But increasing the number of small silver dramas you have access to is going to remove random elements that occur because a particular hoard was large or a particular hoard was small. Right? And so is going to eliminate those kinds of errors. So there are certain types of errors that are eliminated by going to large numbers. And there are certain types that are not. One of the problems we have in numismatics is that we face a very large number of errors that are systemic, they're built into the analysis, and so can't be eliminated simply by increasing the sizes of our samples. Seth, want to say something? Yeah, I mean, it was good. I mean, well, <clears throat> it's kind of built on what you're saying, but also what Michael's point was was interesting. But you know, the pottery is just an indi in, it's a indication of actual activity and use. And you made the same point earlier, didn't you, about referring to this? Um, the mathematist who, who, who had argued that actually coin loss was a sort of more interesting indicator of coin use than, than rates of minting. Yeah. Um, so it's the same. It's the same argument, isn't it? And, uh, <clears throat> and I suppose when you're talking about that kind of systematic error that's built into coin collecting, this focus on the pretty examples, I've had exactly the same problem with. Um, you know, with ceramic studies for many years mm -hmm. being dominated by by, mm -hmm. by the field of, of art history and um, collecting pretty bits of glazed pottery. But once we start to look at the whole assemblage, that's when it becomes. Mm -hmm. in, in, in India, the, the thing is that, as uh, Shavendra said, is that very seldom, are, when you're looking at a big archaeological site, the current settlement is usually on the highest ground for obvious reasons. So don't get washed away in the rain. And so people are living up there, so you don't excavate there. And then this is kind of comp compounded, the problem's compounded by the way archeological practice goes on in India. So the, the, the government of India says, oh, well, the historic site, we have to buy some land here to have an archeological reserve. And it's always on the side, because the people are up on the top. So the archeological reserve is on the side of the big settlement mound, and so if there's money to do an excavation, they excavate on the side. And as you've said, it's not representative, you 
know where people lived historically, it's just that it's in the reserve or it's near the reserve and they can excavate it. So that, you know, if, if all the data across all your archaeological excavations is coming from the side of settlement, you're going to have a very uh, skewed thing. I'm not saying it's always happening, but that sort of seems to be the way it's going. And then the other thing about it, the other sociological and historiographical thing about it is that Sharma was, as you've just read from the first slide, you know, he's got a really compelling style. You know, he <laughs> writes really well, and he's kind of humorous, and he's engaging, you know. And who follows him as the professor in Delhi, you know, the preeminent historical post in, in India is that sort of weakling Chattopadhyay, you know. And so the result is that there's been no significant intellectual challenge, really, to his his rather strong theories, which on the face of it are extremely compelling. And so, and added to by his personal charm and everything else. Um, and so you end up with a kind of mindset of, of feudalism and decline. And so, the, you know, as Einstein said, you can only see what the theory allows you to see. You can't see anything otherwise. So, because there's going to be no city, city sites out in the countryside, they're not there. They don't exist. The theory doesn't allow you to see huge urban settlements in in, archae in ar archaeological terms. They've just vanished, you know. And you know, some foreigner like me walks along and you kind of stumble along. Oh, what's this gigantic mound that's never even been mentioned? You know, it's a gigantic city site. It just doesn't exist because it doesn't exist in the literature. It's just not there because the theory that Sharma has propounded, which he recognizes to his credit is just a theory, let's see how it works, has created a situation where there cannot be cities because there's only villages. So they don't exist. So also the whole thing is a massive distortion. The, this method of uh, counting points and drawing lots of historical conclusions was subsequently taken up by uh, lots of other people in and sort of drawn, there, there is a whole uh, a book called Imperial Monetary System of Mughal India. And there are sort of uh, uh, essays, long essays written about how uh, certain mints functioned and what their outputs were, because Mughal coins are dated, so we, you know that you know, it, they were issued in certain date, unlike these ones. Um, um, and then they were sort of drawing conclusions saying that, well, because in between 1650 to 1655, the mint at Surat, extant number of specimens, 100, 55 to 60, 3,000, 65 to whatever, back again. So in, oh yeah, so in, in that period, the mint production went up. So the GDP went up. And there's this whole argument about what was India's GDP in Mughal times, <laughs> which is all based on this sort of methodology. Of, of counting coins, which is, I think, frankly, pernicious. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not because the British Museum has so many numbers of rupees stuck at Surat mm. in so many years. That doesn't mean that the Surat Mint was actually functioning better in those years as compared to other years. So, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a really flawed uh, method, which was um, sort of, I would say imagined and visaged by Sharma, but then taken up by lots of his, his uh, students and followers, and then applied to different, different areas of economic history. And I have to say, this is maybe as a way of conclusion, you're perpetuating this because whenever I come back from India with a handful of Indian coins, you always pick the ones that the museum doesn't have. Yes. And so, so there's these little five rupee coins or whatever they are, and they end up in the collection. And so we've got all the types yeah. because you're collecting them. Yeah. So someone will come along in 300 years and the British Museum and say, gosh, they have, you know, look at the number of coins that increase. Well, yeah, so like, there you are. <laughs> you it's like yourself. the purpose of museum collections to, yes. to draw conclusions about quantification. Yeah, because museums are interested in Typologies. Typologies yeah. right. That's what the collection. Is That's what the collection is for. Either to display them, to show you here is an example of something that existed, or to have a record of here is an example of something that existed. And of course, additional to your list of 
distorting yeah. uh, his typology. Yes. Obviously, that one represents the delivery time. Yes, absolutely. And of course, what happens is, if you have a period of time in time when, for some reason, you get fewer types, right? Because in mobilization, this is the practice of simply issuing the same type of coin over and over again, or um, anonymity, which means that, of course, the, the bit of the coin that you are usually collecting doesn't change. Right? When this happens, you have fewer coins in the museum. Right? It's the natural, natural body. So Joe wrote very, Joe's written some very interesting articles on the coinage tradition of India. Right? And one of the things that he pulls out, which is, is that Indian coinage seems to show a higher degree of tendency towards immobilization and um, anonymity in its production. But actually, that's not a universal feature of Indian coinage. It's not evenly spread across the whole of the two and a half thousand years of Indian school. A huge amount of it is concentrated right here in this period. Right? That coinages that were not immobilized, right, like the Western satraps, where the name and the date changes, right, and, and they're being they're replaced by these coins that have Kumara Gupta's um, legend just repeated over and over again. And then replaced by the coins, the Sasanian coinage, an import of Sasanian coinage into the north, north of India, which in, is in, the, in presumably about 500 AD. Then that coin design continued in use till, till about 1300 AD yeah. in Western so, India. So, and, and some of them you can distinguish. There are other small features added which one can make one to distinguish them, but the majority of them, all you can say is this is an early one, that's a late one. That's about it. And so it's possible that that change in the way coinage is, is visualising itself has something important to say. But one of its effects is to make it harder and less interesting to study it. Right? and to reduce the number of examples that you will find in collections. So, right. But immobilization, repeating designs, say, is usually associated with the coins being used. It's usually associated with a need for you to have confidence that a coin looks the same way coins have always looked. More confidence in that than you're placing in the political authority who's backing it. So it's often a function of large production. So the, the irony, in a sense, is that, I mean, this is especially true of Gupta coins um, and Kushan coins. There are moments in the Gupta and Kushan coinage where the coin design is incredibly variable. So every museum needs 20 or 30 Chandra Guptas minimum. No matter how small your museum is, right, you need a lot of Chandra Gupta coins. You need a lot of Huvishka coins right, because they all have different designs. You have to have one of each. Right? Every private collector does. Right? Which in, but in fact, Huvishka coins are incredibly small production. Right? There's not very many of them at all. But almost every single one that's extant is published. We, you know, there is, it's, very, it, it's very unlikely that there's a, more than a handful of Huvishka coins in the world that are not published in some form. Right? You can pull together a, a little over a thousand of them published, but that's probably all the coins... That, that's my I think Jason. Jason. I'm in trouble, really. I mean, everything, everything you've just said yeah. makes perfect sense to me. It's almost Sharma esque in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do not trust uh, it. <laughs> I suppose, I mean, just harking back to, to what Gethin was saying, it, 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 it's at that level. Speaking as an archaeologist, it's at precisely that level of, you know, okay, we can see this going on in the coins, therefore that means this must have been the case. It's at that level that I start to question and start to wonder to what extent are we applying wider theory, macroeconomic theory, bothering, uh, borrowing from proven examples where the numismatic data has been matched with other archaeological data from other contexts and other parts of the world, perhaps other periods. 
or, or, or are there truisms that, that really can be applied across the board? You know, I, I just sort of wonder, I wonder what would happen, I mean, at, at what point, what do you need as a numismatist for there to be archaeologically, textually, historical, to base your sort of chains of inference on surrounding data as opposed to on one of the, the sort of starting points in numismatics is that, that um, coinage is an official device, mm. or largely an official device, and it follows particular patterns of behaviour in order for it to be operated. And therefore, one can make some deductions about it you know, when, when you find you know, uh, Gora Hymns redoing, re examining all the coins from Taxila mm. and under the first Kushan King, there's a huge um, increase in the number of coins cut in half. And half and somewhat else affecting this, yeah. So you know, those quarters. Quarters. And quarters yeah. as well, yeah. And so so one can look at what economic phenomenon might have induced that to happen. Mm -hmm. And we have other parallels from elsewhere. Um, and so one can draw some conclusions about what's happening to the monetary system at that, at that time. Um, so, so because coins are, are money, and money is part of so the money works system. in the same yeah. way. Uh, well, it doesn't work the same way, but, but there, there are patterns or behaviours that uh, one, can, one can see. So, you know, when when you find one coin in excavation, you can tell very little. When you find a whole raft of coins, then you can draw some conclusions the, the, about the monetary. About, about the coin system, about the, which isn't always the same as the monetary system. I think. But does that not I think it does, but um, I th in terms of what we would need, mm. just to make absolutely clear of how mm. bad the situation is, I would say that for each of the 20 or so series of coins that I kind of looked at in the survey, which you saw, mm. right, I would say you would need a solid type catalogue, syllogies of most of the major collections, a die study, five or six archaeological sites right, with a large number of coins from well-stratified contexts yeah. and in the region of 50 to 100 hordes. Okay. And then given that data, the system is reconstructible. Right? And yeah, we've got that around the room. And we've got because that. Of treasure troves, of course, of antiquities. We're building that sort of data for around the room. And so one can start to draw much more firm conclusions for, for, for something. And in so South Asia before 1100, we have that for punch mark coins and early Kushan, and that's it. I suppose what I'm also getting at then is, and this is an honest question, I mean, but it, is it that you're only interested in making conclusions about the monetary economy? Um, the flip side to which is, is it, is it that you absolutely have to have those type series and all of that quantification to make any conclusions? It, it, is yes. it that you need that because you don't have, and no. because there is an absence of information about everything else that was going on? Or Without the classifications, typologies, and contextualizing information that sites and hordes yeah. provide, the coins aren't really telling you anything. The coins are part of anything. anything. The coins are part of systems. They are part of the system that hammered them at the mint. They're part of the political system that backed their authority. Mm -hmm. They're part of the economic system that moved them. They're part of ritual and social systems that resulted in their deposit, right? They are affected by military systems, like the example of Western satraps. Mm -hmm. They can tell you something about any of those systems, but because they only tell you something, because they're trying to tell you something about the system, they can only tell you that when the coin data 
has been embedded within this system, within our system of classification mm. and the data and the contextualizing. Yeah, without that, without that contextualization of the coins, That's can't. The context. Yes. yes. Well, R.S. Sharma's uh, um, approach ignored one of the major factors in, in human mm. behaviour, which is the collecting. Mm. Practice, mm. And, you know, and that's part of the story of, of numismatics. Mm. That uh, how how do we how is the data assembled is part of is part of you know, the story. And if you ignore that, then you're going to misinterpret. It. I mean, the, the the literature on coins is absolutely brimful of examples of people taking coins out of context and writing things about them which are not true. Well, the the, it's, the it's literature so on Sanskrit text, as it yeah. has been said. I mean, you know, people pick up uh, a text that is attributed to some author of the period we're working on, and they think they can open that book and and just step right into, you know, the age of Kalidasa without any understanding that uh, how does Kalidasa land in this room? Well, he's you know he's been subject to copying and copying and copying over you know seven or eight hundred years. And the whole point of text critical study is to understand the layers and try and recover the oldest part of this text so you can actually make a historical uh, conclusion about what the shape of this text was. Now, the fidelity tradition is quite strong, so it's not so bad, but, but the point is it's the same kind of methodology. It's exactly what you're doing, try to get the the chronology of the typologies. You know, people look at archaeologists and think, all these broken bits of pottery, they don't tell me anything. <laughs> you know, it's a complete waste of time. It's a busted bits of junk, you know. But the thing is that getting the the sequence of the pottery in order so that when you walk around a site in India that you're not going to excavate, you can pick up a few pieces. You can say, right, it's inhabited from the 6th to the 11th century and there's no sign of anything before or after. That's a big conclusion to be able to make in 10 minutes walking across the site, which you can do in the Eastern Mediterranean. I think Seth so wanted to raise that. In that sense, it's analogous. Mm. What, about, um, <clears throat> what about when we don't find coins? I mean, this seems to be a big problem as yeah. well, because we're trying to infer economic social systems and all the rest on the basis of the coin finds. And the main factor you talked about is kind of collecting behavior and, and, and the impact that that's had. But there's also surely lots of, uh, the, the, the actual occurrence of coins is high even as well and doesn't also necessarily reflect usage and, and there's, there must be so many factors there and they're, they're, most of the sort of archaeological situations that I've worked in, has, it's been in that, you know, like the Indian Ocean where we have, there's a big debate about, you know, to what extent were the Sasanians involved in Indian Ocean trade? There are, almost no Sasanian coins in circulation in the Indian Ocean. Does that mean they were or they weren't involved in Indian Ocean trade? We don't really, you, know, it's, 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 you could argue it both ways, couldn't you, really? Um, and I think the same in India, there's been, a, you know, and I'm sure everyone knows a lot more about it than me, but the, the, the whole thing of, of coin hoards, in, in Roman coin hoards, and you know, whether that indicates Indo-Roman trade or not. And so the, uh, the, the absence of data is the question of absence and that's really interesting and, and we had the one example of this document with the jugs of wine and so yeah. forth and those Bactrian documents have seals on them clay seals and bits of string and they're sealed up and of course there's just this small cache of them that are complete a few others around but if you go to a place like Sumed in, in Punjab uh, where you know, the British Museum's got 20 or 30 just the seals, mm -hmm. and apparently, I've, somebody told me they were reading some report where 40,000 seals were found in Sunni. I don't know if there's a typo in the report or not, but anyway, there's a vast number of them there. So this is like a banking center with, you know, thousands and thousands of seals with all the documents gone and only the, you know, the BAPE seal left. Mm -hmm. So every single one of those had some kind of transaction like this and non-monetized probably. Yeah. So, um, so there's a huge amount of economic, you know, just the presence of those things indicates a huge amount of economic activity of the type 
but by analogy, you've got to be bold and say, yeah, it's by analogy, that's the scale of it. Mm. And also, you see, the fact that the coins are unattributable to us, which makes them less collectible. Yeah. But in, the, in effect, you're talking, you're looking at a very complex monetary system. The people, people, when they're using it, they are, they've got to know what the values are, how, how, the, how the values are determined. So the fact that there's a huge number of unattributable ugly coins actually refers to a very complex money use. So there must be there must be money changes in, involved. There must be you know so when hundred of these these dramas were deposited against, you will get an interest in what sort of coin. So there is a lot of complexity there, which which is completely sort of obliterated by the fact if you just look at the coins and say well these are ugly and unattributable, mm. then. You know, <clears throat> then all that context is, is lost. So Thinking about yeah. context, what? Sorry, sorry. No, just I mean that the, 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 it's the same point, but the distribution of coins archaeologically is, is influenced by so many important factors, isn't it? And so precious metal coinage. I mean, obviously, it depends what kind of coinage. Precious metals are, are going to go out of circulation, and so you might have huge areas that are totally monetized, where you find almost zero coins archaeologically. And, you know, Gold and silver we, we use a lot. Yeah, so, and, is, so and, is, and is there a bias in in where the coins end up? Are we only looking at a small, perhaps bias sample of a well, particular use yes. of coins by looking well, only at the ones that have appeared to us yes. in hordes? It's very important to remember that mm -hmm. the the only two things that we know or or that we can establish. We don't in this case know because we don't have the information. The only things we can establish in numismatics are the moment when a coin was born, the moment when it was made, and the moment when it effectively died, right? When it went into the ground not to be recovered until we got it. Right? We have those two moments, but everything we want to know about the coin, right, really happens in between, right? Um, it's, it's the bit in between we want to know. But we can only, with numismatics, in most cases, right, tell what happens at the very beginning and the very end of that coin's activity. Right? Um, and that's, you know, and there's enormous numbers of biases. You're right. There's systematic distortions in the way we find material. The systematic distortions in the way the material is reported. And something I picked up and was just ref looking up here is that one of the cases made is. That the, so the the demonetization is also associated with the deurbanization phenomena. Um, you know, sites go out of use in this period, and they come back into use later. Claim that some of the people involved, and there are a number of sites of significant size which report large numbers of coins of the Kushans, right? Which I could use for good stratigraphy. There are no sites and people will reference this, that there are no sites that would give me the same information for the Kushan successes in the Northwest, the Kidrites, the Alcons, etc. Except that there's a single reference in the literature about um, Ropar, which says a hoard of 600 copper coins found in an earthen pot in sub-period 4D contains issues from 200 BC to AD 600. These include Chandragupta, local coins, um, Sasanian fire altar coins, are, which are all also found regularly in layers, right, in the site itself. But Ropar's total coin information is that one reference written in the Encyclopedia of Indian Archaeology by the excavator. The material from Ropar has never been published, right, whereas Ahachatra published Kushan coins, right, um, Taxila published twice Krishan coins. Right? So there's a, a systematic bias in terms of the reporting that takes place, uh, as well as the digging, and of course in the sites themselves. Right? But the critical thing is that the critique of Sharma is not that Sharma's approach of attempting to count was wrong. It's that when Sharma attempted to count, he did so by excluding all the possible factors that might have distorted his count. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you could make that approach and say, okay, 
where can I count where I have some confidence that I'm not? This is the whole point of this group of central provinces coins. You're deliberately picking out a group where you say, actually, the various factors are not operating to the same degree over here. Here I might have confidence. Well, he's, he's, he's dealing with a damaged data set. Yes. He's also carrying through certain mistakes that were made in the generation of those data sets. But he is also doing something himself, yeah. which is that he is making that neat equation of an absence of evidence is evidence of absence, yes. which we all know is an utter fiction. You can't, you can't make that correlation. And that's something that Sharma himself is applying to his interpretation of that yeah. damage data. Yeah, I mean, it's also one aspect of the value of coins is that, as well as being archaeological items, they also have pictures on them, mm -hmm. yes. which can actually tell you quite a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, although it take, you know, the, 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 I mean, there are in, in most branches of, of numismatics two schools: the mm. people who are interested yeah. in what we've been talking about today, and then the people who are interested in what's on the coins. Yeah. And they you know, rarely speak to each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's on the coins and how to quickly attribute a label? Mm -hmm. That is the, 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 the bias to actually identify and put a label as quickly as possible is the bane of it all. <laughs> because then you tend to sort of lose the sight of you know, mm -hmm. If you, you have to have a quick fix, yeah. saying that, well, this is a king, and here he's mentioned in an inscription, it must be him. Mm -hmm. So we can put them in a tray with a nice label. So king, king for every coin and a coin, coin for, for every king. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay uh, we've overrun our time and we've kept the video <laughs> attendant longer than he should be here. He probably wants to go home. Um, so we are having dinner at the usual place. Everyone's invited um, because many people couldn't make it uh, because of the weather. So. Please come along for dinner if you want to. Uh, follow the crowds. Yeah. Usual place. <laughs>